how in the hell did you pull Simone Biden? <laughs> <laughs> so you was really the catch in... I always say we the men are catch, man. I always say we the catch. Yeah, so she really booked you. She did though. She is did. what you said. I was, I was fighting it. I was fighting it. So I was you, fighting it. So, <laughs> so much to say about the history of Simone Biles. I have one line to say about Jonathan Owens, who really can't get a headline without his wife's name in it. and I would like to take you back to last year. I know people's attention spans are short and they move very quickly on to the next viral topic. And some could say, oh, this is so last year because literally this fallout happened in the December of 2023. But I wanted to discuss Simone Biles and her husband's controversial statements on the Pivot podcast that led to a good bit of fallout on social media. Because this particular situation, the way it was handled by the media outlet that produced the segment, the way the celebrities involved responded, and the way the audience very quickly turned on their heel and decided who to throw their ire at, <laughs> highlights a theory that I have long been looking to discuss. How? Little to no dating relationship advice is good, period. Now let me add an asterisk on addendum here before you guys wanna fight me in the comments so quickly. We're not even that far into the video. I'm talking specifically about relationship dating advice. You don't tend to see higher earning men with average looking women. I mean, my body is not average, so. But you're, ma'am, you, please don't make me say it. Say what? I really just wanted some advice. I love your you, I'm giving you. I'm giving you advice, but you're not taking it. The um, advice is, ma'am, ma'am, you're average looking at best. Not to be confused with therapy, self-actualization advice, how to build community and foster a diverse range of relationships. I'm talking specifically about the advice about intimate partner relationships that pushes you towards relationships that are purely transactional and they covertly suggest that systematic issues can be resolved via your dating choices. How to get a man, get a woman, how to end up married and how to get that person to stay with you and treat you the way you want them to. That specific segment of advice, that very specific dating advice is almost never consistently good. And I'll even have to admit that for the most part, I don't mind the brand of dating discourse about becoming the person that you love and setting standards and boundaries and not about how to shape shift yourself into somebody who is suddenly desirable for a still lacking pool. <laughs> Uh, baby, are you watching Ready to Love? Later. You're gonna stay in the box. See you later. See ya. See ya. A less than quality pool of men. What in particular the Simone Biles husband fallout really shows to me is that much of this dating discourse targeted at black women is really about shaming other women. It is a part of the industry of shaming black women, especially when this advice leans in on name calling, pointing at other people as pick me's. I mean, in the world of dating, isn't everyone trying to get picked essentially? Mm, it's a little. One thing about pick me women is they are so far gone in delusion, can't nobody help them. So we know. Simone ain't leaving him. I'm not surprised that she propositioned her husband and approached him and ran him down and slid in his DM because that's what pick me's do. <laughs> you know, they work hard for what they want. I need a firmer definition if we're going to keep throwing that term around. And this advice constantly tells black women that the way you are is in some way unacceptable. There is some program, something that you can buy into that will suddenly make you desirable, even while acknowledging that the lot of our ire right now is that the dating pool and dating does not feel safe. But let's discuss Simone and her husband and we'll really work through my theory here. Stick around. Ah! 
pun fully intended, but I'm shocked by anyone who at this point in time claims to not know who Simone Biles is. Simone Biles is a world-class athlete. She was born March 14th, 1997, and she is the most decorated athlete as a two-time Olympic champion with 37 Olympic and World Championship medals. This past August of 2023, at the US Gymnastic Championships, she became the oldest woman at 26 years old to win a national title, and this was her eighth title in which she was able to beat the seven title record that had been held in place since 1933. She has a very difficult gymnastic move named after her, the Biles 2, which consists of a round off onto a springboard, a back handspring onto a vault, and two flips in the pike position. Say that five times fast again, it won't be me baby because you know I already got a list. Oof. Now we absolutely have to know that for all of Simone's out of these worlds, high level doesn't even describe enough accomplishment that she exists in this world with all her accolades as a four foot eight dark skin black woman with an athletic gymnast physique and yes i think in the discourse that quickly came after her husband's poor talking notes a lot of colorism underline the way people so easily were able to disparage simone now, Simone Biles is among the almost 200 women who came forward with sexual abuse allegations against the former U.S. gymnastic team doctor, Larry Nazaire. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that man's name. He wasn't worthy of me looking that ish up. After these allegations came to light, he was eventually convicted of various sexual abuse crimes and was essentially sentenced to life in jail. Think about the toll of enduring that sort of trauma and then having the wherewithal and the braveness to come forward and face someone who caused you deep harm. Then after this case and the 2021 Tokyo Olympics, Simone, who decided to take a mental health break for a bevy of reasons, carrying the whole team on your back, going to court to face your sexual abuser, baby, I don't blame her at all for taking a very necessary mental health break. But Simone faced relentless criticism when she made the decision to withdraw from sports and media to deal with her own mental health. It has been perhaps the most effusive praise that has ever been heaped on a quitter. I mean, that's what Simone Biles did to earn this exuberant applause. After all, she gave up. But as already noted, she returned to the sport this past summer. Now, I would love to spend most of this video calling the man Simone Biles married, Simone Biles' husband, Mr. Biles, because baby, your wife is the star here, as she should be. But that's already a tongue twister and I can't do that the entire video. So I will acknowledge that that man's name that she married is Jonathan Owens, who was born July 22nd, 1995 in St. Louis, Missouri. And he is now a 28 year old safety for the Green Bay Packers. I don't know a lot about football. I'm gonna just leave it at that. I didn't know the safety did that much. I don't know what a safety really do, but I, is it that much? So no say. I'm just gonna, bullet point this here because so much to say about the history of Simone Biles. I have one line to say about Jonathan Owens who really can't get a headline without his wife's name in it. And it does sort of seem from their more recent interviews aside from the Pivot podcast because Simone is the Vanity Fair cover story for February 2024. It seems that she is intentionally trying to market her marriage and make it a monetizable part of her brand. Maybe I'm projecting with the monetizable part, but it does seem like they are intentionally trying to brand their relationship together in that even in the Vanity Fair article, Mr. Biles is quoted giving the same story again that he gave on the Pivot podcast. And then I question what is the goal of this marketing though? Is it just for monetization? Do they wanna be like Will and Jada? <laughs> I really hope not. Gabby and Dwayne, <laughs> again, I hope not. I'm just wondering how they're not seeing the downfall of all the couples on Black Love, okay? I saw him laughing with this girl and he just had a drink in his hand and he looked like he was having so much fun. And I said, you are right, that is my husband. <laughs> if he gonna laugh like that with anybody, it's gonna be me. I gotta go get my man back, girl. I think it is so beautiful to love with someone who understands 
your pain, your struggles. They don't have to try to imagine it. They don't, they don't, they, they don't have to get close to it because they get up in that skin every day. Why do you wanna put your relationship into the public sphere, especially this early on into their relationship? And at this point, my biggest suggestion to them is that if they're gonna continue on this pathway forward of marketing their relationship, they definitely need to invest, especially Mr. Biles, in media training and hiring a strategic PR team to help them craft the narrative around their relationship. Because at this point, Nobody really wants to hear Mr. Biles consistently repeating that ill-positioned story that he offered on the Pivot podcast. Like she pops up and I'm like, mm, let me see who this is, gymnastics. I ain't never, you know, I, I never really paid attention to gymnastics. So it, it, it piqued my curiosity, you know, so I'm like, okay, that's, 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 a, I, I'll see what's up. Now, what is the Pivot podcast and what was actually said? Huh. I have a lot to say about the Pivot podcast and they're creating outrage for engagement, utilizing the imagery of Simone that they knew would conjure up a very specific response. Playing into the colorism, playing into the massage noir, and then hiding their hands and acting like it was the audience that was doing way too much. Instead of being happy for two people who are excited to be together, two people who support one another wholeheartedly, we've now decided to pick apart one clip instead of learning the whole story. Now the Pivot Podcast is a sports podcast hosted by former NFL players, Ryan Clark, Fred Taylor, and Channing Crowder. Now, if you are like me, you are not a man. You are not in the sports. And so you are not the target audience for this podcast. Two of these hosts have collaborated on other podcasts that had a dramatic ending. And it seems like the one common denominator in the drama is the third co-host Channing Crowder. I don't watch it all. You don't take a shower? I don't, I don't think you really need to watch that much. Like, <laughs> what you mean? Watch every day. Huh? I think you, man. You don't times, take a shower every day? Two times a week. Oh. Three times a night. <laughs> hey, listen. Bro. That man looks like the glob. What was that character's name on Super Mario Brothers movie? Goomba. <laughs> Channing Crowder is at best problematic, okay? And he's very much so known for stirring drama. You have seen this man on your Instagram gossip blog timeline before, maybe in 2012, when he confessed to peeing in his pants during every NFL game. Pee down my leg during any games, I never went to the bathroom in the toilet. Every game? Every game I peed myself. I would just be in the huddle, just pee. Like you wouldn't even, nobody in the stands would know unless you look down like, that's, that's, that's not water, man. My teammates didn't enjoy it as much as I did. Because that was necessary information for the public to know. On the Pivot podcast itself in April 2022, Channing Crowder is the one that went viral for coming at Russell Wilson. And let's put their pictures up side by side because baby, this is a real bold claim. Channing claimed that Russell is a square and that Sierra is only with him because of the money. Russell square. Russell Square, Russell Square, Sierra had a, she, she has a good situation, but she was you don't a, leave Future they, she was and a, get with Russell Wilson. The, the, the thing is, I think though, that's what you're You don't wrong, leave though. Future and get with Russell Wilson. Women, like, a, and yes, women willingly date you for your looks, Chain and Crowder. I don't know. That man is bold with his statements, especially in this interview with Jonathan Owen. Simone Biles' husband, the man has a lot of bravado for someone who has publicly discussed only bathing twice a week. I don't think you really need to wash that much. Like, <laughs> what you mean? wash every day. Now, what happened on the podcast? Now, the Pivot Podcast brought Mr. Biles on to interview him. And I do think from the way that Simone has done her own interviews and the way Jonathan walked into this interview with Simone trailing behind him, that the couple is in collaboration with the idea that Jonathan's headlines will include Simone, that she is allowing her husband to use his proximity to her to build up his own brand identity. Maybe it was even her idea because the podcast headline is Jonathan Owen's name, but specifically him talking about his marriage to Simone Biles because NFL sports fans want to know just about his marriage to Simone Biles. 
uh, even just that thought makes me a little icky because locker room talk is never kind to women. And essentially, the Pivot Podcast is locker room talk. Even the way the question is locker room talk. Bruh, as us pretty red dimes as we are. <laughs> How in the hell did you pull Simone Biles? <laughs> <laughs> and I imagine that Mr. Biles, Jonathan Owens, has some familiarity with these former NFL players and was speaking to them in the same way that he would talk to his teammates in the locker room. So how did you do that, bro? Man, it's really, really how she pulled me, man. That's the question, Oh, man. Lord Jesus. Now you with Freddie. Now it's back. <laughs> now <laughs> now you listen, with Listen, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. Organic story, man. So. Which is part of the reason of why when he tells his story about meeting Simone Biles on the Raya dating app. A dating app, hey, even I have on my phone. And the options on Raya are not great, let me tell you. So I kind of understand Simone finding a man who she finds attractive and uh, pouncing on it, okay? Raya, at one point in time, it was pretty exclusive on how you got onto the app. You needed somebody who was notable, influential, a celebrity, essentially, to give you a code so that you could get added to the app. It would be exclusive. Dating pool awful, but shout out to Simone for finding her husband on it. But as Mr. Biles retold this story on the Pivot podcast after Channing Crowder asked him about, you know, being a, a light, bright, you know, fine, light skinned man, what is it like? And how does that kind of man end up with Simone Biles? <laughs> Yikes. He says that Simone actually messaged him first. Come back to my phone and then she messes me on the app like, Hey, you know what I mean? And I'm, man, that's a, man, this gotta be fake. Like, I don't know, just. And again, this same quote ends up in the Vanity Fair cover story for February, 2024. And it's this same story that Simone herself tells in interviews as well. I don't know why the couple, this young couple has decided that this story is a story worthy of telling again and again and again. But pairing an already poor choice of story in order to talk about your loving marriage or promote your marriage in the public sphere, the locker room talk of the Pivot Podcast added no help to Jonathan. In truth, Simone Biles is lucky. For what? Cause she took a chance. <laughs> she lucky cause she wouldn't have all that. Jonathan said she wouldn't have all that. Hey now. Cause he ain't had time. I, Jonathan, my, I. A story where he essentially positions it as though Simone Biles chased him. Because not only did she message him first, but she also drove like 45 minutes to an hour to come to his house. She came through down um, down to Houston. She lived in the suburbs, so she had to drive about 45 minutes to me. Um, then the rest is history, man. So, so you was really the catch in... I always say we the men are catch, man. I always say we the catch, man. Yeah, so she really booked you. She did, though. She is did, what you though. said. She essentially put herself out there as Jonathan retells the story. Now, it did seem that there was one co-host who had some sense about him as Ryan Clark attempted to save Jonathan in his recounting of how him and Simone Biles early courtship went and was like, are you sure this is a story you wanna tell? Is this really what you're saying? Are you essentially saying that you wouldn't have dated Simone? So I was you, fighting it. So in truth, if I say this out loud, was Jonathan Owens ain't really want Simone Biles. Is and, what you're saying. And Jonathan didn't catch the bait. He didn't clean it up. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> that what you're saying. I was afraid. I I was afraid to commit. I'm like, ah, I'm man, this my this my third year, you know, I'm trying to ah, I'm like, it's kinda <laughs> early. Now, like most popular podcasts, there is a video that accompanies the podcast and the video is edited down. And in the editing, as Jonathan is telling this story about essentially how he was unaware of who Simone Biles was, kind of hard to believe, but okay. And then that this woman chased after him and he wasn't really trying, but after a while he was like, okay, I can get with this. I was fighting it. I was fighting it. So I was you, fighting it. So 
a horrible, horrible story to tell as part of the branding of your relationship. The edited video is going back and forth between the co-host face, a little bit of Jonathan talking, and really a lot of focus on Simone Biles, who showed up to an interview to support her husband and was not truly looking to be interviewed. Like she was minding her place. They seem to be a very young couple. And what is there to find offensive about Simone living in her lover girl era with my man, my man, my man, and wanting to be up under her man, her man, her man at all times. I don't think it's problematic that she showed up to the interview. She answered the one or two questions they asked her, but she was not trying to assert herself. It wasn't like a person that comes to an interview with somebody and they clearly are trying to be a part of the interview. But the edit spends a lot of time going back and forth to Simone's face. And also the first clip shared for this podcast was specifically the segment where Jonathan talks about meeting Simone on Raya and her pursuing him. Not only was this the first clip that was shared, but Pivot Podcast posted the clip to Instagram and cross posted it to Jonathan's account. And the thumbnail that they selected is a picture of Simone zoomed into her face as she is blushing. The setup is crazy. And particularly the setup is crazy because it was clearly edited and not to say that anything was asserted or chopped because clearly Jonathan is not good at retelling stories. This young couple has not worked through the strategy of why they're telling this story in a productive way of telling this story that really assists their brand. But baby, you got the coin, hire the team now that you know. But Pivot Podcast and their team, a sports podcast that had a hour long interview with Mr. Biles and wanted to claim that there's more of the interview to watch, chose a clip that would stir outrage first, that would allow them to reach an audience that exists far outside of NFL and sports fans. And then they proceeded to hide their hands because with the immediate backlash of Jonathan's poor storytelling, the messaging became, you have to watch the whole podcast to understand what was being said. Y'all are just upset over a one minute, five minute clip. Instead of being happy for two people who are excited to be together, two people who support one another wholeheartedly, we've now decided to pick apart one clip instead of learning the whole story. I went back and listened to the whole podcast. I really don't know what was special about it. Sorry, not sorry. It, there was really no insightful part of it. <laughs> Maybe it's just because I'm not a sports fan, okay? But I didn't hear any redeeming part of the podcast that made what Jonathan said earlier in the episode better. And I personally feel that these older co-hosts, maybe not Channing because you can't expect much from him. Every game I feel myself but that, you know, Ryan and Fred would have guided him more, maybe had a pre-talk with him. I don't know what is happening when this interview was even pitched, when this interview was confirmed and what they said they were gonna talk about, like why nobody again and again and again didn't prep Mr. Biles to put his best foot forward. <laughs> but instead, the podcast took advantage of baiting outrage and baiting engagement from a wide audience and then said, folks are doing too much. They didn't watch the whole podcast. Y'all are mean and cruel people and took no ownership of how they ignited the outrage. And shout out to our sponsor, Audible, for making this video possible. You can use my link, audible.com slash Julesy or text Julesy, J-O-U-E-L-Z-Y to 500-500 and get a free trial with Audible. I absolutely love Audible. It was so apt. I just listened to the Song of Solomon. Right before that, I did Beloved on Audible and it was so good. And I love that you could control the narration speed because Tony narrates all her own titles. The baby, it might be a little slow but 1.4 was my sweet spot. And as she says in Beloved, love is never any better than the lover. Wicked people love wickedly. Violent people love violently. Weak people love weakly. Stupid people love stupidly. But the love of a free man is never safe. There is no gift for the beloved. The lover alone possesses his gift of love. Whew. Tony is so good and I highly recommend listening to Audible. So actually go ahead, use my link, audible.com slash Julesy or text Julesy to 500, 500 for your free Audible trial.
pick up Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon and come and join my club as we enjoy it this February and March. It's actually a very, very, very good listen and you will wanna know what was going on in Toni's mind when she wrote all those crazy characters. Cause girl, it's a time. So yes, a lot of the onus lies on the Pivot podcast and their positioning the narrative from that episode. But to get to the audience's response and the colorism and the misogynoir that quickly manifested as a non-sports audience absorbed this couple minute clip of Jonathan poorly retelling a story about his relationship with Simone. And in an episode where it is clearly Mr. Biles, Jonathan Owens misspeaking, it was wild to log on to social media and see immediate content about Simone Biles emasculating her husband. Simone Biles being the masculine one in the relationship. They did that interview and he basically told us a story about how Simone Biles chased him. So yeah, he is the prize. We want men to be so masculine and this and that, and we, uh, you know, talk bad about men being sassy and feminine. Well, yeah, when they were the ones getting axed out on dates, why? <laughs> if I was a man getting axed out on a date, I would ask for flowers too. I I'd want her to open my car door too, because I'm her girlfriend now. Y'all make these men y'all y'all girlfriends, and then y'all surprised when they be acting feminine and sassy like they're the prize. They are the prize. Simone Biles being a pick me always being a pick me and that's why her man is telling the story the way he is i don't understand why so many people are mad that a pick me got picked like what y'all expected she played her part she played the role of a pick me and she got picked and people reveling in the opportunity to wait patiently for the demise of her relationship. I don't know what about that interview and all the poor talking points and all the lack of media training for all the unwise narrative that was shared. I don't know what about that clip says that it makes sense to wish harm and trauma upon Simone Biles and to not only wish for that harm and trauma upon her, but that you are going to wait for it to happen so that you could be gleeful about it. Now, Simone, being the young thing she is, was on Twitter liking comments about people being jealous. And I actually think the standard response to people coming for your relationship is to say people are jealous of you. Everybody does it. I don't know if that justifies waiting for harm to come Simone's way. And I think the audience response in particular was primed because so much of the content that we highly engage with is content that is meant to bait us into an emotional reaction. That is what outrage content farming is. We have been socialized to constantly give these reactions over and over and over again with very quick, not a lot of thought put into it. But also there has been a heightened amount of dating discourse that had flooded spaces like TikTok and Instagram. Kevin Samuels passed away and his rhetoric has just transformed and evolved and is now being espoused by black women in different form. Messaging across the board about dating that highly fixates on the idea that the woman is responsible for the man that picks her. That the woman is the one to knock down, drag out when the man does something wrong. I understand it's not fun to just be able to acknowledge that you don't know that man and then like what else is there to say about him because you literally don't know that man. So it is easier to pick apart someone who is already in the public eye, been drug apart for her athletic body, for her dark skin, for her short stature. And I also feel like the one little bit of grace that I wanted to give Jonathan was that likely in the locker room with how harsh and nasty the locker room discourse was that he has gotten very used to people asking him in particular about his wife's physique. I don't know. Again, why though? If that is something that you want to address and acknowledge that y'all have not gone and got media training or sat down with a strategic PR team to figure out how to carefully and productively share that story. Cause the way he did it on the Pivot Podcast, baby, we all had our faces scrunched up at that story. I was fighting it. I was fighting it. So I was you, fighting it. So but the quickness that folks are able to twist 
Jonathan's misspeaking against Simone and drag down Simone just highlights again and again and again how we have absorbed so much dating discourse that simply names all the women that we are different from. Whether that woman is masculine or the builder of her home or the pick Misha, whatever names we have come up with, I often find that the productivity of advice that focuses so much on telling people how they can value themselves over others is never really worthy advice because it just simply tells you how to be judgmental towards other people, not how to actually, regardless of the world around you, become the person that you love. Instead, it trains you to always be ready to disparage a woman who does something that you can say realistically, hyperbolically, out your ass even maybe, that you would never do. Oh, I would never let my man speak like that. Oh, I would never be the one in that situation. And suddenly it becomes a competition between you and the woman and no longer about the bad behavior that was conducted by the man. It again resituates your focus and your lens on the woman. And what did Simone really do wrong in this situation? How are we mad at her for standing by her marriage? As goofy and bad as I think this interview was, do I think it's enough to justify a divorce from somebody that you just married recently? Have y'all been in love? Like, let's be for real. I can't be mad at her that she would publicly defend her husband because that's the vow she took. And that's also what I don't understand about this dating discourse is how does Simone get so much of our ire if the goal, the claim goal of this discourse is to end up in a marriage with a man of me. It is that for black women, as I said in my industry of shaming black women video, that we are born into a crooked room and we are constantly told how to reshape ourselves, how to comport ourselves, how to contort ourselves for a room that's always going to be crooked and we are never going to fit properly into. And it was interesting to watch black women so eagerly participate in admonishing a black woman for not fitting into that crooked room when she really made no mistake of her own. Do we really need to be told that we should value ourselves? That we should not let people take advantage of ourselves? That we should be able to turn to our partner and get care, safety, and respect from them? Yes, dating discourse standardly does all those things, but do we really need to also then be told that we need to manipulate, we need to lie, we need to push towards transactional relationships because other women over there are not doing it and look how bad off they are. Look how bad those women are. Is that advice actually productive? What does that sort of advice actually yield us? If we are constantly absorbing advice that tells us that the way we present ourselves naturally is not acceptable, to have locks is unacceptable, to have braids is unprofessional, to have your natural hair, mm, girl, why couldn't you get a silk press? Neutral colors is best. Wear less makeup. Ooh, she like must that. be smart. But a woman that's smart and disagreeable is not a woman that's in high demand. She's not a woman that's really wanted. A woman who's smart and cooperative, but not agreeable, is kind of useless. Because she'll only cooperate when she agrees. All this advice about shape-shifting ourselves for a dating pool of men that gives what? Every game I feel myself. And then when high achieving black women who have no pool of men that have ascended to their equal, like what is the equal to Simone Biles, a world-class dominating greatest in the world athlete? What is her equal in her age range? And how many of them exist for her to choose from as intimate partners? So how do we then admonish her for finding someone who she claims to be in a very loving relationship with that at least has some means and has a lifestyle that is similar to the lifestyle that Simone desires to live. How does her marriage become a thing that she should be ashamed of? Because dating discourse constantly shapeshifts itself to constantly shame the woman. It is not actually about 
finding the good man, about the man being the good thing, the man performing as a specific type of partner. It is simply about if a woman fails to get a man who is this mythical being of varying political standings because the discourse, even when it comes from one, is almost never consistent in its approach that you have to find a man that can constantly shift towards whatever standard dating discourse is giving at the time. And if you fail, baby, you bad. You deserve harm. You deserve divorce. And I'm sitting fitting to wait for it. That is insane. That is crazy. And I think it's a little too easy to do that on somebody like Simone because a lot of the commentary that I saw just verged on like derogatory. I get it that Simone has dated two light-skinned men and ended up marrying one. I have not found the girl to ever come out and say anything about preferring light-skinned men. And I do wonder if maybe the way the internet and the public have often talked about her presentation and her appearance swayed her desire to get the prototypical light eye color, light-skinned man who maybe in some way she was informed that she would never be desirable to. I was fighting it, I was fighting it. So I was you, fighting it. Why are we so keen to berate the woman when it's the man who did the wrong thing? Mm, I don't know. I would love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for tuning in. See you on the other side. Deuces.